Let us put ourselves in the loving presence of the Lord. In the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Most loving Father, we glorify and thank your name. We thank you for the gifts of this new day. Please help us use it for your honor and glory. May we humbly ask you to shower our speaker today of your greatest inspiration as she shared the most of her knowledge in this field and this respective topic for today's lecture, as we may also absorb the knowledge that we will learn today. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Name Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you on this uh, second uh, in the three-part lecture series on social justice implications of land use change in the Philippine uplands. I'm Alvin Ang, the chair of the Department of Economics at the Ateneo de Manila University. I'll be moderating today's uh, session. I'd like to introduce our um, person who will give the opening remarks and introduction to the project. I'd like to introduce Dr. Andres Ignacio. He is the director for planning and uh, geomation of the Institute of the Environmental Science for Social Change and the Philippine coordinator of this uh, project called Lucid Project, which is the lead partner of the University of Namur in Belgium. Dr. Andres. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ang. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, the second uh, 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 part in a series of uh, three talks, as uh, mentioned by Dr. Ang. Um, the first one actually was uh, given by me and uh, it focused on uh, land use uh, change monitoring uh, as part of the Lucid project. We're uh, going to uh, listen to another aspect of the project uh, this afternoon. But uh, before that, uh, I would like to, before I enter into the uh, introduction to the project, I'd like to contextualize the, um, the situation where the project is actually uh, being implemented or was being implemented. It actually ended in August, uh, just this year, got extended because of the pandemic. But um, at this stage, uh, if uh, the 
video can be played uh, to contextualize the situation before I give uh, actual details of the project. Thank you. Challenges to confront. No set way forward. There is no actual model for how to proceed. The economic model will, you can see how it's gyrating at the moment. So, how do we step through this? Your understanding of the Philippines is bizarre. Oh. Maybe sometimes besides, and then we then ask war. It's so unfair because it makes so much of me than now. It's me. It's so much of me than now is now. It's, it's young people trying to strive for change. But no one is supporting them because the rest of the, 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 the Philippines doesn't care. They say they already put these names, excluding them. And if we're going to redefine who we are as Filipinos, we really have to look at that again. We cannot forget the moment that was. Ang options. One option is to, to loan sa financiers, and the second option is to loan sa bank. But sa bank, one thing is that uh, magloan ka sa bank pero the requirements na kailangan gastos sa mukha which is nagloan pa ulit sila ng money para lang to meet all the requirements ng bank so hindi rin nakakatulong yung other rural bank options na binibigyan nila sa, sa farmers so daw sa financiers naman sa mga middle money so masyad malaking patubo nila which is 10% it's very unfair for the farmers that sila yung nag sila yung trabaho but ang kumikita is sila nasa middle middle money with all the hard work that's gone into for a hundred, for two hundred, for three hundred people, because the hard work and all they are left with is their sweat. You are moving money. That's what developing the economy is. But it's not human development. There is so little social integration today. I really don't understand other. I understand the market before I understand people. I understand people through the market. It's very difficult to learn the actual meaning of the transaction, the consequences of the transaction. It's
it's just reduced to this for this. But how balanced is that? It's becoming clear it's not a balanced transaction. Are we at a turning point here? What are the lessons that we've been learning in discussions with community? Do we see that a shift is possible? Across all of that, in all the discussions, is actually the focus on, on the youth. Where is the youth in all, all of this? It's not just um, a question of economics, but it's also a question of well-being. Young education, it's not really just changing the kids. It's really affecting the whole community. It creates this atmosphere na uplifting for them, that there's hope for them. It doesn't matter whether you're the richest person in the world. It's the same thing that move us as humans. Wealth is not a problem. It's not good or bad. It's how you use it. And how you use it with and in respect. These lessons, these basic elemental lessons that we've been sharing need to form an integrated strategy that focuses on upstream, the core of the business model, seeking for change. We should be guided on the decisions the companies make as future leaders on how we affect everyone, not only because of profit making, but I think more as we lean as the future decision makers for our company or for our country, we lead towards more sustainable, more helpful way to our society. We need to see a sustainable sourcing of materials by companies. We need to be able to follow that through and look at the production in a sustainable manner and then see the transportation and distribution of these goods being carried out in a sustainable and transformative way. In this way, we really are respecting both human rights, the basic dignity of people and the common good. This is where we've got to move towards the common good and care for the planet.
Sorry, I was muted. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think that video just gives us a, a better understanding, you know, an overview of the context where this project was taking place. It was actually, uh, the video uh, was really about how uh, Father Pedro Walpole had uh, coordinated with uh, then Dean of the Ateneo Graduate School of Business, uh, Rudy Ang, uh, on how we can get students from the business school, MBA students, to experience, engage uh, in the field and see the realities of uh, communities and uh, try to discover the impacts of decision-making in the corporate world on the actual people who are working the land. So uh, we had two runs before the pandemic, uh, have not uh, resumed that, but anyway, it was a very good experience for the students uh, at that time. So uh, I will skip some of the slides that I gave last time uh, in the first uh, engagement and <clears throat> This is just uh, the reality, you know, the context where uh, we are in the uplands here in Bukidnon. No? Uh, you see a lot of corn planted on very steep terrain. And for example, here in this area, you can see the river is brown. No? This is from uh, sheet erosion from the landscape. Uh, in other words, the terrain a lot of the terrain where uh, corn cultivation is being done is uh, already deforested. So the project itself uh, was conceptualized because uh, we had observed this phenomenon uh, of uh, the farmers being uh, in debt. You know? uh, if you were listening to the video earlier, uh, you may have caught that uh, the financing interest on the small farmers who plant just uh, uh, an average of 1.3 hectares per farmer, they uh, are charged up 10 to 12% interest per month for their financing. So we wanted to see how is this a reality here and is it a reality in other places also in the, in the Philippines? So, we chose three of the major corn producing provinces in the Philippines, Bukidnon, Isabela. Isabela is actually the uh, corn province of the Philippines. Bukidnon is number two. And for the Visayas, we chose Iloilo. Now, the project aims to provide tools to tackle negative impacts of long-term land use change due to high input crops in the uplands. And the specific objective is to enhance well-informed decision-making among actors, including farmers, traders, civil society, and policymakers involved in land use change due to high yield variety corn. To promote the establishment of an equitable and environmentally responsible agriculture and therefore livelihood in the upland and in the uplands. And finally, the overall objective is to contribute to the sustainable development of upland communities and foster social justice. So the results framework that we have, the first result is to sign, uh, get scientific knowledge about social drivers, risk perceptions, and social justice impacts linked to HYV corn agriculture in the uplands. And uh, the second is uh, academic capacities in the field of social justice and social sustainab sustainability are increased. So this involved granting academic degrees to uh, the South or to the Philippine scholars. We have three, uh, un uh, two universities uh, partnered in Belgium, the University of Namor and the Catholic University of Louvain uh, in the South, uh, both French speaking and the Ateneo de Manila and Central Mindanao University here in Bukidnon. So we also had a result framework, uh, the third result uh, of scientific based information on the drivers social and environmental impacts caused by HYV corn in the uplands is produced and used 
for awareness raising. So the video, for example, and the field course that we developed is part of that um, uh, result and resources are used efficiently and effectively in the project. Now, uh, the activities are to document land use change attributed to uh, high yield variety corn using geomatics technology, which is basically my field also. So land cover update using uh, satellite imagery for Bukidnon, Isabella, and Ilo. We also wanted to analyze intertemporal dynamics of land use transformation and associated, how, associated household decision making using development economics tools and methods. And socioeconomic survey of upland corn farmers in Bukidnon. So this was also conducted. And I think um, uh, Clarice, our main speaker, will be talking to us more about that. And these are just some of the uh, photos of that activity that they had. We tapped the uh, indigenous youth to conduct the surveys. Uh, which was a very successful uh, endeavor. So we also upgrade geomatics capacities applied in the field of social sciences using state-of-the-art and remote sensing technology. As you can see, this is a multidisciplinary project. So not just uh, in economics, we also tap uh, the field of geomatics technology mm -hmm. and also philosophy and uh, social justice. So internship of geomatics, uh, these are, I'll just go through this very fast. We also wanted to uh, strengthen the research capacity of development economics and philosophy in the Philippines. So an MS and PhD in development economics and a PhD in philosophy. So these are two of our students who are now from the Ateneo who are now in uh, finishing their PhD degrees in the University of Namor and organize field-based courses on sustainable human development for business schools. So this is uh, part of the uh, that uh, last uh, uh, activity. We, we did partner with the Ateneo Graduate School of Business and had, uh, had them experience uh, and learn more about the dynamics of the projects and what we were trying to investigate. And uh, we wanted to assess farmers' well-being related to agricultural practices through participative workshops and qualitative field investigations using uh, capability approach indicators. And that is now in the field of PJ, uh, our scholar. And to optimize academic dissemination of evidence-based research findings and recommendations and conduct awareness raising activities, targeting actors, driving land use change. So we had uh, various activities like a field-based forum that we conducted in 2019, of course, pre-pandemic, we were still free to do this. And these are some of the photos of uh, that field-based uh, forum where we gathered uh, people, uh, st uh, stakeholders on the national level uh, some NGOs, government uh, people working on corn uh, from the DA. We also had private individuals, academics, some people from the, uh, the Ateneo as well, and CMU. So we went together to try to learn more about the realities and to disseminate this information to the local, to other uh, uh, stakeholders. And then we had our uh, online conference. The project conference we had in November of 2021 it was not possible to do this face-to-face um, -face at that stage. And we had, to, uh, we had to do the project. So it was good that we had all the online tools available to do this. So we invited a number of international uh, uh, people for this, uh, particularly our keynote, Madame uh, Josiane Gauthier from uh, CIDSE in Belgium, and uh, Dr. Nair from FAO, and uh, our own local scholar, uh, Dr. Artemio Salazar, and Ms. Lillian Mercado from WWF Asia at the time. So this is just a 
uh, photo of a uh, screen grab of uh, the people, just one subgroup of that uh, big uh, forum uh, conference. So um, thank you. And I hope the, that that gives us an overview and appreciation of where this project is actually uh, coming from, you know, what prompted us to do this investigation and studies. So as part of uh, the empowerment of uh, the RS, which is the funding agency of the Belgian government, we funded uh, our local scholars from the Philippines so that they can um, share this uh, information or share these technologies and skills to the local universities when they return uh, and teach. So without further ado, I will um, uh, I'll introduce, I guess, uh, Dr. Ang, would you, uh, can I pass it on to you to introduce our uh, main speaker? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ignacio. Uh, please, uh, now we have an understanding and context of the whole uh, project. And so I'd like to introduce now our speaker. By the way, uh, Dr. Ignacio is in Alay Balay, and our speaker is uh, in Belgium right now. So I'd like to introduce uh, our speaker, Ms. Clarice Pauline Manuel. She was part of our department uh, if economics uh, as a lecturer prior to her uh, going to this PhD studies. So she's now currently um, a PhD student and researcher at CRED at the University of Namur. So without further ado, Clarice, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Alvin. So I'm just gonna start to share my screen. Yes. Go to the screen. Okay, so hi everybody. Um, so again, um, this is Claire, Claire is right there. Okay, and um, so today I'm going to share with you some of the results that we have uh, on the project related to the Lucid um, project that was explained earlier by um, Dr. Ignacio and. Um, yeah, so I will focus mainly on the analysis of profits and profitability and risk of genetically modified corn and a similar variety in um, Bukidnon. Um, so yeah, if you have um, other questions later after the talk, you may contact me through the email address you see on the screen. And of course, yeah, I have other projects going on as well um, about female empowerment and gender issues in Nepal and um, Philippines, yeah. And so aside from um, this being motivated largely because of the um, reasons uh, Sir uh, Ignacio mentioned earlier, there are also some facts that motivate us to go into this investigation of comparing genetically modified corn with other uh, similar varieties. And because um, in the Philippines, we were the first ones actually to legalize the commercial use um, of genetically modified corn in 2002. So we were an inspiration to many countries uh, when it comes to biotechnology actually in Asia. And um, yeah, that's, that was quite impressive. <laughs> and, and since then, um, many farmers have been using and adopting genetically modified corn and gene uh, corn production has increased so much. Um, and um, next to rice, this is the second most important crop that we have. Um, but the irony is that, you know, despite the importance of this crop, um, because it's a staple food in Visayas and Mindanao, and we plant it largely, the corn farmers, ironically, they have a very high poverty incidence of 65.2%, which is actually, if you compare it to the national level in the same period, which is 16.6%, it's extremely high. So then, we wanted to go deeper and figure out what is happening in the farm itself, why farmers are actually staying and largely poor. Another fact of um, why we went into this project 
is because in our first interviews with the farmers, we found out that there was um, a similar variety that emerged since the introduction of genetically modified corn, and that's called Sigi Sigi. And it's planted by about 70% of the farmers in our sample um, when we did the survey later on. And depending on whom you ask, this corn variety was either by accident or on purpose, I mean, created by accident or on purpose um, by, we are entirely not sure. So if you ask farmers in uh, Bukidon, they will tell you, oh, there's this guy from South Cotabato that comes um, and sells us the seeds. And he did the breeding himself. He crossed uh, genetically modified corn with a, a local variety, let's say Tinigib or Visaya, and that created Sigi Sigi. But if you ask farmers that um, somehow are affiliated with, let's say, Masipag or Greenpeace or whatever, they would call this contamination uh, because uh, corn is an openly pollinated uh, crop. So it means that even by the movement of the wind, if you plant GM corn on one side and um, another corn variety on another, it will mix. So, so then maybe this was created by accident. We're not entirely sure. Um, but then, yeah, um, if you also think about it from the perspective of Monsanto itself or Pioneer, the ones creating the GM corn, they might think of this or even consider this as a form of piracy because they have the patent rights to having the genetically modified um, crop, but then it's being used in other corn varieties that are not authorized. So yeah, so it's quite interesting. But anyway, um, so aside from these facts that I laid out, in existing corn literature actually, especially in the Philippines, a lot of the comparisons are only done between GM corn and non-genetically modified corn. But nowadays we've had GM corn for 20 years and a lot of varieties have sprung up, as I said. And so it's important that we try and update our knowledge about using genetically modified corn, especially for the smallholder farmers. And so our research question is then uh, the following. So does genetically modified corn cultivation result in better yield and profits for the small scale farmer than an alternative corn, Sigi Sigi corn? And which crop variety exposes the farmer to greater risk? So we'll be looking at it in terms of three um, scales uh, in the research question. So the profit, uh, production, profits, and the risk. Okay, so a little background, but I think the video that you saw earlier already set um, the stage for the environment in the Upper Polangi um, farmers. So basically, um, what you see here is that their education levels are actually quite low, and they have a large number of family between 4.5 to 5 people per household. And they have small plots of 1.8 um, area cultivated on average. So it tells you that the area is quite poor with small um, farmers and big families. So then that will help us think about the results that I will show you in a bit. So now jumping onto the results, let's begin with a comparison. So from now on, I will say GM because genetically modified is too long and it feels like a tongue twister. Um, so yeah, so GM corn and Sigi Sigi corn. Um, GM corn is typically yellow and then Sigi Sigi corn is also yellow, but also has white varieties. So depending on, um, you know, the purpose of the corn, we have different colors. So yellow is typically used for the feed, and the poultry and uh, livestock um, food consumption. Whereas the white corn is typically for humans. So it's the stuff we eat um, like uh, binatog or something uh, or the rice uh, corn grits. Um, and then the other um, thing about genetically modified corn is that it has a stack trait, which we call HT and BT. Um, SG corn has those exact same traits, but of course it is weaker because, because it is mixed with another um, corn variety. So for those who are not familiar, HT means herbicide tolerance. And this means that it can withstand um, spraying of glyphosate. So glyphosate is a typical weed killer you find in all, um, all over Philippines. So it's used to, to clean up the weed without having to manually pull them out. So this saves a lot of effort 
for farmers, um, especially after rains where, when weed starts to sprout out. On the other hand, Bt is Basilicus thuringiensis, which refers to um, the corn being protected from the Asian corn borer pest. So what, what this does is that, uh, so it's prominent all over Asia, that's why it's called Asian corn borer, but, but what it does is it eats, um, it eats the corn cob or the corn stalk in the, in, the, in the process of growth. And so there will be no corn produced in the end, or you would have very little corn produced. And so genetically modified corn, it's GM because of the fact that these traits are added to it. So then CGC corn was able to inherit that, but of course it's weaker. And one more main difference between the two is that uh, with genetically modified corn, you would have to buy the seeds every cropping season. So it's something that you cannot save and replant, unlike the traditional seeds that we had with Tinigib and Bisaya. Sigi Sigi corn, from its name Sigi Sigi, it can be planted over and over again. Um, so farmers do not have to spend on seeds every cropping season. And uh, from what we know uh, from interviews, the, they can reuse it up at least four times. So then they can go further up to that. And now to put some numbers into the comparison between the two corn types. Okay, so here I have a, a simple table that shows you the, the computations of revenue, expenditures, and profits per hectare. So it means this is um, all of the comparisons are for this one hectare plot of land. And um, for the sample, I have about 223 with CDCG and 95 on GM corn. Um, so we have a large amount of sample, I would say, to, to analyze this um, data. And um, so we have the values in pesos. And one thing to note is that we purposefully excluded labor expenditure because um, it was very difficult, we tried, it was very difficult to monetize the in-kind payments uh, to the farmers because sometimes they are paid by corn cob or they, they are paid by uh, kernels. And so like monetizing each one was, there were different conversion factors, so it was quite difficult to, to know, actually. Um, and so, yeah. Um, and so uh, we did it by Hector as well to make it easier to compare CGC and GM corn, knowing that some a lot of farmers who plant CGC plant it on smaller lands versus genetically the GM corn are planted on bigger plots. But that's not our concern today, because now we have um, a comparable scale. So for the revenue, um, we notice, we observe that CGCG corn has 17,000 pesos and GM corn, it's 31,000 pesos. So there is a huge difference here. And what we try to do is to investigate, is this difference because the price between the original and the copycat is different? Or is it just because the yield is different? So we did simple mean difference tests on the price uh, received by farmers, because as mentioned, I think, in the video, um, it is the trader, the middleman, who decides the price um, at which the farmer would be able to sell his corn. Because, you know, unlike rice that is highly regulated, corn is not very much so. And so the, the trader has more power to, to determine, oh, I want a lower price for this copycat. I want a higher price for the GM corn. But what we see on average, uh, based on the test that we did, there is no difference. So it means that whether you use the original or the copycat, the CGCP, you receive about the same price on average from the trader. And so it means that this difference in revenue is just because genetically modified corn is indeed more productive. So, um, yes, and on average, if I remember correctly, uh, yes, I have it here. So it's 1.7 hectares, uh, 1.7 tons per hectare that is produced on average at the GM corn plot nowadays. And um, if we compare that to the earlier papers that were published in 2006, they were saying that the average in Bukidnon uh, for small scale farmers were 4.2. Um, 4 so to, to drop from 4.2 to 
to 1.7 tons per hectare is a is a huge difference for just amount of uh, for just um, 10 years. So then it means that overall in Bukidno, the GM corn production actually has declined, despite total production increasing. But this is a very specific sample, so maybe there are some specificities in Upper Polanyi that we haven't considered yet. So now let's move on to expenditure. So the typical expenditure, of course, would sometimes have to be the seed um, for Sigi Sigi farmers, but always for GM corn, they have to spend about 5,000 um, for 18 kilos of um, genetically modified seeds. And they also have to spend fertilizer. And for fertilizers, there are different types that they use depending on the soil needs. Uh, before it was like that, but with genetically modified corn, there's a specific formulation that farmers have to follow. So they no longer have to look at the land itself to know like what does the land actually need, what does the plant need, but they just put what is necessary to produce uh, the GM corn itself. Uh, for herbicide, this is also um, uh, this something that the farmer will decide on depending on how much uh, weed he notices on his field. But we see on average still that genetically modified GM corn farmers produce uh, use a lot more of the herbicide than Sigi Sigi, but it's not that big of a jump compared to the fertilizer where you have more about double uh, the amount of fertilizer inputs. And if you also recall from the video, they were talking about um, farmers taking loans to be able to sustain their farming. And a lot of the things that they loan actually have to do with the inputs. So the fertilizer and herbicide, well, mostly fertilizer because it, it is the largest chunk of their expenditure. And imagine um, you can only get the revenue at the end of three or four months. But in the middle of that, you spend already 16,700 in total for the seed, fertilizer and herbicide. And then there was a storm that happened Let's imagine that. So farmers would lose automatically 16,000 plus interest versus Sigi Sigi farmers, they would lose a lot less. And so when it comes to farming GM corn, there's it seems like there is a lot of um, issues given the way the farming industry, the corn industry is built, where middlemen are profiting a lot. And so for post-harvest expenditure, this has to do with the drying, the shelling, and the milling of the corn, and we see that um, it's a bit it's higher for genetically modified corn, which makes sense because this is um, an expenditure expenditure that is based on the amount of harvest that you receive. So the more harvest you have, the more you have to dry, the more you have to shell. So this is something mechanical. But overall, if we take the difference between the revenue and all the expenditures that we have here we would end up with a quasi-profit of 9,200 for Sigi Sigi and 11,700 for GM corn. Now, after four months of hard work, you receive 11,000, 9,000 to 11,000. So if you divide that into four, you receive about 2,500 pesos per month of all the hard work that you put in because of the insane amount of expenditure that you incur as a farmer. And if you put uncertainty more of that because of climate change, then the losses would be much larger for genetically modified corn than with Sigi Sigi. Um, and we, we also did a simple test here, like, does the 2,000 peso difference between Sigi Sigi and GM corn matter? So we found out that no. So it means that on average, Sigi Sigi and GM corn uh, yield about, uh, no, uh, have about the same profit in the end. So they are equally profitable. Okay. Um, so in this next um, graph that I will show you, um, so this presents a cumulative distribution function. So two types. So we mapped out the, um, the farmer level profit. So, cause earlier in the earlier analysis I did it at the plot uh, at the hectare level. So now we ignore the scaling of um, the land size that they cultivate. Now we just um, add everything up per farmer, how much they're earning in a month, depending on which corn variety they plant. Mm -hmm. So there are two important notes, uh, two important things to observe here. So first one, the red line, uh, maroon line uh, of GM, 
you see that it's wider and longer compared to the CGCG line, the blue dashed line. So what this tells us is that the spread of profits for farmers are actually wider for genetically modified corn, which means that there is more variation, there is more volatility when it comes to uh, receiving a profit in genetically modified. It means that you can go to more extreme values than with CGCG, because with CGCG, it's a lot shorter. So this means you can get either very high values up to 150,000 peso after four months, or as low as about negative 40,000 pesos for the last four months, and then smaller for CBC. The second thing that is important about this graph is this intersection with the zero vertical line. So the zero vertical line tells you the probability or the actual distribution of farmers that received no profit, so a break even, um, at the end of four months. But remember that our computation of quasi-profit does not include labor yet. And with genetically modified corn farming, GM corn farming, farmers utilize more labor because they have more harvest, they have more plots or something like that. So the values could be way bigger than what I will tell you. So the intersection of uh, the two lines, the two curved lines with the red vertical line, gives us, uh, so let's go for CGCG first. Um, for the blue dashed line, the intersection with the red line is 0.2. So it tells you that 20% of CGCG farmers received zero or less quasi-profit. On the other hand, um, the intersection of uh, GM with um, the red line, so it's about 33 to 35% which uh, tells you that 35% of farmers have received zero or less quasi-profits uh, in the last uh, cropping season. So then overall what this tells us that the risk of getting nothing is larger for GM corn than it is for CGC. So if you compare, I mean, to me, I find this quite surprising because you know, like uh, when we monetize everything then you will see that okay, farmers really do lose a lot uh, when they when they plant GM corn. And so uh, I will not take longer. I guess uh, what what does this imply for um, smallholder farmers? So overall, the results have shown that it seems genetic GM corn is actually not quite sustainable for them because of the high cost of required inputs and the fact that they are more likely to be indebted in case of climate um, change. So if, if there was a storm that, that comes, you know, they, they just, and, and if they borrowed from a financier, they would likely lose a lot um, in the end and they would sell their land or give up as farmers and move, move to another place, which is some of the stories we've heard um, in that area. And if they, do end up with profit, it's very low. So 9,000 to 11,000, it's not enough for an average family of four to five people. So they will not be able to continue planting in this way if they stick with genetically modified corn. And so um, just to conclude, so I was able to show with the data we collected from the survey, that um, GM corn is not that different in probability, uh, in profitability. And the main difference is that there is a greater risk uh, in planting genetically modified corn than a similar variety, which is CDC. And we also saw that um, the production has decreased a lot since its commercial commercialization in 2002, where we have 4.2 tons per hectare to now 1.7 tons per hectare. And so for, for uh, small farmers to be able to survive and continue uh, to be farmers, you know, they would have to think about really adopting the right crop or even diversify their crops because a lot of the farmers that we've met rely solely on corn farming. So then if anything happens to their corn, they're done for. But then what is important is you diversify uh, the crops that you plant, 
you know, to have some sort of um, fallback measure in case anything goes wrong with corn farming, which would be more likely given the climate change um, that we are facing right now. Um, and so, yes, that concludes my presentation. I hope it was clear. Yeah, if you have, yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Clarice for your presentation. Uh, we will now open the floor for uh, questions. Uh, anyone who has a question, you can just uh, raise your hand and then uh, please identify yourself, what organization, and then uh, we'll ask Clarice to answer the question. Anyone? Okay, uh, we have a question from uh, Sir Joey. He says, oh, Joey, you recognize. Hi, sir. Hello. I'm Dipo Marinig. Sorry, can you hear me now? I guess, yes, better. Yeah, okay, thank you. So I'll lower my hand first <laughs> before <laughs> I forget. Hi, thank you, Clarice. Um, it's good to know the, that you are, as of now, you're comparing to uh, before. I think that was not, the, there was no comparison before between the two varieties. And that is a very good uh, comparison between the two in terms of risk and profits. Um, so I assume that this uh, survey was made uh, in a certain year only, let's say 2017. Um, despite the profits and the risk, uh, that's about 20% that you won't get anything for Sigi Sigi or 30% that you won't get anything for uh, GM corn. Uh, from 2002 until presently, uh, the, the corn planted in upland, even the upland, it, it actually changed the upland uh, of Mindanao because of the widespread plantation of corn. Even small farmers are doing that. Uh, my first observation, it's because of the uh, HT, uh, because of the weed resistance of the GM and Sigi Sigi. You don't have to put so much labor, you plant, you probably had to sell all that expenditure because, but at the same time, you will be free of weeding, which is the the which is the the constraint of corn farming before two thousand two or when there was uh, GM corn was introduced. So uh, that's my reason. But because uh, you've said that it's risky and not really profitable, but despite the fact that it actually spread throughout Mindanao from 2002 until presently. So my question would be, is, is that because it is, uh, it is it may be profitable before because there was a large change of the harvest from four tons to now it's just about 1.7 tons, as you said. Is that the reason? Uh, you probably have no data why it spread out, no? Uh, because you your survey is I I assume nga, sabi ko baka isang taon lang ninyo ginawa yun. but that that is a question that's still in my mind sorry if, even it probably is a a, a a constraint or a limitation of your study but that will still be a question that is interesting to answer um so to answer that um so for our survey we asked um the most recent harvest for the prices but then um we asked in terms of harvest we asked for the last four cropping seasons they have so we have at least four cycles for the farmers and so we have some information about the movement of um genetically mod GM corn and Sigi Sigi corn and the traditional corn varieties. Uh, but it's in another paper. <laughs> I did not present it here uh, because it was from my colleague uh, Ludovic who studied um, the causes of why there is this big decline over time, despite more land being um, 
allocated to GM corn, even if, it, okay, so for two reasons why the yield is actually declining, because a lot of the land that has is being added it's mostly upland, um, so hilly parts. So then in terms of farming, it's not very ideal because when you put fertilizer on it, it just slides down, it erodes when it rains and whatever. Um, the second reason that's, and this one is scientifically or economically tested, um, is that the spraying of the herbicide, um, which is what you mentioned as well, uh, the spraying of the herbicide on the plots themselves uh, actually increases soil erosion, leading to more landslides. And so as more land is um, used, more, lands, more landslides happen, more crops, um, corn crops die or are lost. And then they cannot go back to planting on that land because what's left are the rocks. And so there's more land allocated, but still they are not being used anymore. So I think that's one well, two possible uh, answers to the to the question. Um, I hope I answered it. Joey? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think that partly answered the question uh, that it was still profitable because of large harvest before. Yeah. Okay, okay thank you. Um, yeah, uh, any other questions? Uh, yeah, we have uh, Andres, Dr. Ignacio is raising his hands. Uh, sorry, just uh, as a follow-up no, uh, from that question. Yes, it may appear nga that uh, uh, it may be profitable, but I think uh, one thing that's driving it also is the, <clears throat> the, the corn is a uh, very, uh, uh, very uh, easy to dispose of crop no and uh, and it's also easy in terms of the uh, the access to financing for example it's also uh, easily accessible you know you can just approach the butleries it's uh, you can just approach or ask someone who knows a financer and you just get yeah. introduced no 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 paperwork nothing no unlike banks etc that's why uh, I think that's what also drives it. Um, uh, it makes it very easy to access funds. Uh, it, for me, <laughs> the idea I had before was like um, uh, five, six, no, the, the, lo the loan sharks. No? People still avail of it, even though it's so, uh, the interests are very high, but it's also because it's easy, so so much easier for them to to access the funds. Anyway, that, that's just off the top of my head. Sorry. Great. Uh, thank you for that uh, comment, Dr. Ignacio. Yeah, we want to listen to others who are here as well. Uh, our other colleagues, particularly uh, those involved in farming, would be a good time to share your thoughts or any questions to Clarice. Meron pa ba? O sige, habang nag-iisip kayo, I have some some questions to, to Clarice. Actually, I was uh, looking at the cost. No? You, you, talk, you said something about the fertilizer. I mean, the cost of of uh, producing this is just too much. I mean, look, the sige-sige fertilizer to to uh, total cost, total, total expenditure is about 75%, three-fourths is fertilizer. And yes. GM is about half, about 50. Now, this was this survey, I'm sure, was done prior to the Russian-Ukraine war. Now, Urea, yeah, yeah, yeah. Urea 2018, is, yeah, 2018. Urea is now four times uh, the price. Mm. So fertilizer so i i doubt it that uh, there are people farming right now with these prices i mean it was already punity but 75 percent in 2018 and at four times uh i mean uh, i say we at the at the department we were looking at the overall production of uh which is the next crop that we will import because basically <laughs> 
the production of all agricultural products in this country is flat over the last 20 years. I mean, with the increasing population, it's flat. So I'm actually just, you know, I, I when I saw your figures, uh, you know, I, I, I'm no farmer, but but I know something's terribly wrong here, right? Yeah. And and uh, I, I was looking at your recommendations. What would you, I mean, I, uh, I, I was just thinking you were saying because these are all small small farmers right would it be yes. better if they come together and be, you know do corporate farming rather than individually trying to compete with each other with small tracts of land diba? Um well in my opinion as well that's one of my first recommendations actually is for for the small farmers to organize better themselves to be able to demand something at least from the government because they don't really get support like there was the national corn program but mostly it helped large scale farmers not the marginalized farmers and and so i think that indeed maybe trying out corporate farming might be better but then it could be problematic in the sense that splitting up the work could become tricky um, for some people because cooperation is sometimes difficult to sustain. And so I really think that, um, yeah, maybe external organizations could help them, um, like what ESSC is already doing in Bendum, like to, to mobilize people to work together. That, that's something that is really needed, especially now with the high inflation. You're right, that's a very valid point. Yeah, it's a big problem. Okay, th thank you, thank you, Ice. Um, I was just, you know, looking at the numbers, simple numbers that you showed, uh, makes me thinking, you know, how if this is happening in corn, I don't think this will be much different in, you know, uh, subsistence kind of farming which employs fertilizer. Right. Mm -hmm. And one of your recommendations was to do uh to you know to multi-crop basically. So you cannot yeah. just plant corn, you have to multi-crop. To save garden leaves. All right. So yeah. And and, uh, recommendation, uh, one last thing. Yeah, so okay, I've also like, in my previous projects and with this one, I've met um, a lot of organic corn farmers and possibly shifting towards to more sustainable practices with less reliance on uh, unnatural chemical inputs to the farm. That would be one way that they could get out of the inflation problem. And also the, the, the trader problem in case they go into debt. Because once they do um, use anything they find on the farm to make their crops grow, then that would be, I think, one solution as well. Yeah. All right. Anyone else who has a question, please? Uh, okay, we have a question coming from uh, Miss Sylvia. Go ahead, Miss Sylvia. Hi. Um, hello. Good evening. Thanks, Clarice, um, for sharing the presentation. This is just a comment in terms of what I think Dr. Ang was saying about um, um, why can't we organize uh, farmers, you know, get them into more, um, ano tayo, mas organized na yung, ano nila, yung grupo nila rather than individuals. Remember, we are dealing with um, a landscape that has, you know, a lot of conflict. Um, there's the military um, presence. Um, there are a lot, there are armed groups. So there is that continuing also social military um, context in an area that, you know, where people are really trying to just earn a living from the land that they have. So apart from the weather, the climate, they have to deal with this ongoing conflict. So hindi siya kapareho sa ibang lowland context where you can easily just organize probably farmers get them together on a common hirap. So I think that's one more layer, one more dimension of Clarice in terms of yeah. trying to deal with the reality of the uplands, uh, especially in this area also. So comment lang yun, Dr. Ang. 
Thank you. That's thank actually you. a good input I might consider putting in my conclusion. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Silvia. I think that's that's fair. I mean, uh, the socio-political condition yeah. also, you know, uh, assuming all things are equal, that is an that is a disequalizer at that point. Yeah. Uh, right. Any other uh, comments and in, in, uh, in, uh, observations you can share? We have okay. Uh, recognize we'll recognize Eduardo. Yeah, please uh, tell us where you are from and what what's your question? Okay, go ahead. Yes. Um. Well, curiously, um, doctor, I um, noticed the difference in cost between fertilizers. Now, um, top of my uh, what I'm most uh, struck me the most was the price in the seeds. Diba? Parang nine hundred something lang for the sigi sigi and 3000 plus for the gm corn um i'm just curious why is there like a persistence of using the gm corn when upfront costs for the start of any planting season sobrang stark difference na there's just a big gap in the prices is there like a um reputation for gm corn or is there a like a good rep for gm corn that it's really productive or is there a bad rep for Sigi Sigi that it's, like you said, it's a pirated crop? Okay, um, so to answer that, I would say um, both are GM corn actually. Yeah. It's just that one is the original and one is a copycat. So one is the free version because they just replant. But overall, farmers find genetically GM corn attractive for the two reasons that I mentioned earlier, the straight, uh, the straight, the traits that it has, you know, the the herbicide tolerance, the fact that when they do weeding, they don't have to pull out manually anymore, and this takes them hours, like at least four hours in a day, just to pull out uh, the weeds manually in their one hectare of farm. So if you just spray, it takes less than an hour, and you're done. Um, the second thing is that uh, the GM corn actually protects um, the, the corn cob from being um, destroyed by the Asian corn borer. So then the seeds are, you're more likely to have a good yield when you use GM corn than when you use other varieties. Just if you use typical OPVs or HYVs, they're very vulnerable to this pest. And so the yield will actually be lower because they suffer from that versus GM corn. So I think that's why farmers find GM corn very attractive. And in our sample, a lot of them that have stopped GM corn want actually to, to go back to planting GM corn because they, they want all of that benefit back. And this just gives more power to Monsanto and Pioneer, you know, and, and selling the seeds, getting more profit, making farmers farm out of... Um, out of Monsanto directly because all of their money goes to them, basically. All right, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, Eduardo, we didn't get your organization. Um, Gigi Song from Ateneo. All right. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, we, we have time for more questions. Are there any? But I, uh, yeah, we have uh, Joey again. Uh, Sorry, Joey. I did not introduce myself, Kanina. So I'm from the economics <laughs> department, also from a uh, colleague of Dr. Ang. So okay, because there are no questions anyway, uh, si Doc Andres <laughs> meron. <laughs> but uh, Karisi, this is again outside your your study, probably within your limitations. Uh, I wonder if, because uh, Lucy is an interdisciplinary, so I don't know about the the household survey questionnaire that you have mm -hmm. with regard to the household decision making. Yeah. Is uh, it's the option of uh, livelihoods that they have. So if they keep on they keep on deciding to plant corn because there was no other option, or uh, even if there's a uh, like um, there is a risk of uh, 
arm encounters, etc. They still plant corn, and uh, and in that way, that is my uh, an interesting question because uh, how how do a household keep on deciding to pl plant corn, taking all the risk? Uh, with a wider risk spread with GM corn and a, and a narrower spread for for a sigi sigi corn. Uh, so but in, you don't have to answer if you don't have that. But I wonder about the questionnaire. Oh. Um, yeah, so for the questionnaire, we don't actually ask them why they choose GM corn. But I have some ideas of why they adopt in the first place. <clears throat> because in this area of the uplands, upper Pulangi, like a lot of the lands are sloped. And if given the chance um, that they had a flat land, they will not plant corn, they will plant rice. But because they have um, hilly topographies, they would choose the second most profitable, which is corn in this case. And I think pineapple production is more expensive than corn, and so they don't go into that. So yeah, that's one possible explanation. But yeah. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Joey. Uh, I think Dr. Ignacio was also raising his hands earlier. Yeah, okay. Yes. Uh, ano lang, uh, I think uh, the, siguro immediately after this, you know, what I mentioned earlier, um, that's it's so easy to get the financing for, since we're really looking at smallholder corn farmers, you know, just one, one to two hectares lang talaga yung kanilang uh, 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 land holdings. So it's really, uh, I think, the ease of getting um, financing, getting money actually. Sometimes uh, before the financing would be in cash. So mm -hmm. the financiers have now wisened up because the cash would be used for uh, emergencies in the family like uh, uh, like school, uh, school tuition or school related um, gastos is coming up, so they would use that. So uh, now uh, they have uh, a smarter scheme. You know, they would uh, the farmers can only get the the inputs from a designated um, trader. Uh, trader already, so they don't get get the cash except for the labor no, costs. So I think that's one of the reasons what's, uh, that's driving it really is um, the, the ease of uh, access uh, to money uh, to, for financing no? and the ease of disposing of a crop. Um, yeah, you can always sell your corn crop. No? Uh, if you go into like, uh, of course, uh, Clarissa, pineapple is just not for a smallholder corn farmer to uh, okay. plant. Uh, you know, th these are other factors. Thanks. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Andres. Actually, I was wondering, similar to what Joey was uh, ano, asking earlier, if he, in the questionnaire, uh, it would have been... I'm not sure if you ask them uh, if they were recipients of the four Ps, diba? so yeah. it might have some kind of an impact also uh, somehow in the behavior, right? In in why they choose to remain, uh, continue to farm uh, corn. No? So I'm not, did you, did you have that in the questionnaire? Did you ask them? We have a question if they do receive some type of government assistance and one of them is 4Ps. Mm -hmm. But why would why would 4Ps help them with corn farming? It's for education. Yeah, because then, then we have extra money to do, you know, that would free uh, them from thinking of uh, okay, improving okay. their productivity because they have already... They could they would remain in corn because the, the like what Andres yeah. was saying, it's easy to get money from and financing from from other crops, uh, from from uh, other from financiers, and then if you have you don't need to worry about education help at least for the small children. Could could be also because this was this already covered the four piece right period. 
Yeah, yeah, it did. It did. But yeah, okay, because I always thought that the four Ps was targeting education outcomes. And, but okay, so they give them just money yeah. and do what you want. Okay. Uh, I think Alvin, uh, the, like what PJ mentioned in the chat, no, uh, financers make it more convenient, also easy, no? No? easy, uh, uh, easy for the for them to dispose of the harvest. You no, know? uh, they just go there. Of course, when they go there to buy your your corn, they will dictate the price, and it's going to be lower than the the market. You no, know, the the market price if you have to bring it on uh, by yourself. So. so net net of the logistics and all the transaction costs, they will be okay with it. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's, the, that's the, I mean, it's so easy uh, for them, you know, it's more convenient, but uh, it, for them, it's just part of the, the package already. Uh, otherwise, they have nothing to plan or they, they have to, uh, go through some hoops to find what what uh, crop they will be planting, etc., or doing it themselves. They cannot uh, uh, afford to self finance. Uh, some uh, a financer or a friend of mine before said, if you have five hectares of land, you can eventually self finance. But uh, lower than that, uh, you're going to you're you're not going to uh, survive. Yeah, that was exactly what we were trying to say earlier, right? If you put, if you come together, right, then you will have more, you can have economies of scale, right? The reason why it's so small, uh, I, I'm actually surprised they are continuing with 2,000, at least just about 3,000 a month, like, right, Clarice, uh, revenue. I mean, and then that, that's why I, I, I was thinking the four Ps could have helped them if they are beneficiaries. That could sustain them. Because otherwise, if you're not making money, you would probably think of other crops na, na lang, no? easier like I mean, kangkong or 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 you know the turnaround is much faster. But I'm, I'm, I'm I don't know the land, so I, I cannot uh, you know you know it better. Hey, I think we have time for one one more question. Uh, if there's any, yeah, there's a comment here from Ruena. So, Riaga, uh, Clarice, you can, she's asking about your oh. policy recommendations. Yeah. yeah, policy recommendations, that's a bit tricky. But um, what I would suggest, probably based from what I've learned in the area and from speaking with farmers and traders themselves, probably is like more support in, for farmers in general when it comes to inputs. Because that's where, if you, if you remember the table I showed you, more than 80% of the revenue is eaten up because of the inputs. So I know that in economics, subsidies are a tricky thing, but in terms of helping our farmers who are the core of our nation, I think it's important that we, that we think about supporting them through subsidies. I mean... It has, uh, it was successful in some ways in the US and in Europe, but I mean, there are limits and we'll never know um, what could actually happen uh, if we do this program of supporting the farmers through inputs. But if is if that is not possible, one other recommendation I would have, as I mentioned earlier, is to do a different type of farm plan in the sense that you either make a diverse, diversification of your crops, or you switch to sustainable methods of farming. Because with the threats that we have with the inflation, as mentioned earlier, and the threats of climate change, more uncertainty is coming. And so farmers might lose a lot more given the risk that is associated with GM, GM crop. That would be, I think. Hey. All right. So. Thank you very much, uh, Clarice, uh, for sharing the outcome of your research. Uh, we, we're looking forward to the complete study, and and uh, you know, and and find you know I will know we know you will find it fine tune it further for the policy uh, recommendations and its inter interconnection with the other studies uh, in this Lucid project. Uh, at this point, I think. 
like uh, before we leave, I would like to take this opportunity to have a photo of everyone who is still here. Okay, so uh, may I ask everyone to please open your camera so that uh, we can record your presence here as well. So thank you, Clarice, uh, for the presentation. Thank you as well, everyone. And I'm, I just want to plug, um, we also have another paper uh, related to the Lucid project, but this is less about corn farmers, but more about um, couple behavior. So I'm going to put um, the link here, I guess, uh, if you want to read more about it. Um, yeah. I, sorry, how do I? Sorry, no. Okay. There, it's in the chat, I think. Okay. Yes, so it's about sharing norms in Philippines. So, yeah, thanks again to the Lucid team and every Ateneo as well. <laughs> All right, so Titams, take charge of the picture taking. Okay, one, two, three. Another. Wait a minute. Okay. Okay. Just waiting for someone. Okay. One, two, three. One, two, three. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. May uh, humabol pa ice the chat. So yeah, that's uh, okay. Yeah, if you want to yes, answer so, that. Yeah, wait, I can yeah. answer now. So I mean. Mr. Ronel already answered, but I have an answer to. So um, farmers are, are, depending on the, the crop they plant, whether it's the yellow or the white, sometimes they don't sell everything as well because they keep a portion for their own consumption, especially if it's the white corn. So um, if they did want, they can easily sell it because there's a huge demand um, for the chicken feeds industry and the cow feeds, uh, livestock and poultry. So they can find it. Um, and in, in our survey in 2018, the lowest price I think that we saw was seven pesos per kilogram. And at most like 13 or 14. It's depending on the season that they sell. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, about the processing methods, um, some of them do it at home as well. So for the Sigi Sigi, the... The expenditure for the drying, shelling, and, and uh, milling is quite low and is, is indeed lower than GM corn because they do it all by themselves at home. And it's something I've tried myself too. It's quite interesting. They use a nail, uh, a set of nails, and they push the corn through it and all the kernels go out. And it's interesting. But yeah, aside from using the technical uh, machines. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Ice, for entertaining that last uh, question. Yeah. So I'd like to thank everyone uh, here who have uh, joined us for this second uh, of a three-part series of the presentation of the Lucid project. There will be a third one and we will uh, inform you accordingly uh, on the details of that. And uh, at this point, we'd like to thank uh, everyone, particularly the director of the program, uh, Dr. Andres, uh, who is here to share with us uh, the overall perspective of the project. And of course, uh, ICE, uh, who is, uh, uh, we're, we're looking forward for, uh, for you to come back to, to the department and share the knowledge that you have gained uh, while working on this project. It's very interesting. Um, it's particularly uh, in regard to the needs of the country. I would like to close this uh, session. I'd like to share with you a slide that... Uh, that we have been uh, putting together in the Department of Economics. Okay. So just to show you, talk about corn. Corn is the, on the left-hand side. See the production of these major crops are flat all over the last uh, almost 20 years. So food for thought for everyone. You know? It's not just happening probably in corn, not just in the uplands but it's happening all around. So we'll have to think clearly about how to help our agricultural sector, the farmers, uh, and 
and really think about food security over the long term as well. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone and put a close to our session today. Thank you very much again and look forward to seeing you in our next uh, Lucid presentation. Thank you and God bless. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Good evening.